Hello AP Calculus BC students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School for our final video covering topic 9.3. 9.3 sort of putting the finishing touches over what can we do with parametric equations involving calculus and we've been talking about arc length or distance traveled one and the same. But this video sort of takes a bit of a detour with what the content is on the AP Calc BC exam. And I want to talk a little bit about surface area of a solid of revolution. We talked about it a little bit with um, our rectangular fun uh, functions from topic 8.13 as a aside, an optional topic, not tested on the BC exam there. And I just wanted to follow up a little bit here. It's something that you would typically see in a college Calc 2 course, but again, not going to be tested on your AP exam. So what is this particular surface area that I'm talking about? Well, if you recall the surface area formulas from the uh, uh, rectangular portion of our lessons in unit eight, we notice that you're using the idea of the frustum of a cone, which is two pi times the average radius times the arc length. That's going to give you this outside surface area. If we add up a bunch of those by way of using the definite integral, we can then get a total uh, number of, of, uh, of these basically these circles, right? 2 pi r is just the circumference of a circle. Multiply that by how many circles? L in this case, and boom, you've got your, your, your formula. And the thing I wanted to point out is that the 2 pi is pretty obviously found in the formula. The g of t or the f of t, depending on your revolution, is going to be the radius. Now you want to remember that if you revolve around the x-axis, so if you have a situation like this, then the radius is going to be measured by your y value. But if you revolve around the y-axis, then your radius is going to be measured by the x value. And you can see that this square root expression is going to serve as that L that we talked about in the beginning parts of 9.3. So there's the formulas. Again, not going to be tested on the AP exam, so you don't have to sweat about that. But it's kind of nice to have a little bit of exposure to this um, in, in your high school experience in case you go on to take more calculus in college. So let's go ahead and take a look at our example three. It is a non-calculator question, so we should be able to integrate this by hand. It says, let C be the arc of a circle, and that circle would be x squared plus y squared equivalent to 9 from 3 to 0, uh, 3 comma 0 that is, all the way up to this really creepy looking ordered pair 3 halves comma 3 radical 3 over 2 as shown in the figure. Find the area of the surface formed if we revolve C around the x-axis. And I went ahead and, and captured this picture so that you could see what's going on. We sort of have this bowl shape, and we're going to find out how much space is around the outside of this. Now, this particular problem, a little tricky because we have a rectangular equation that is given to us instead of our typical parametric equations. And so what we're going to have to do is think about, well, what are we going to use for our x of t and our y of t so that we can take their derivatives and then we can square them. And so it has that extra little step. So what one would have to remember is that x of t, as always, is defined to be the radius times the cosine. That goes back to our discussion uh, early on with parametrics, it's going to permeate through polar at the end uh, and the uh, end of this particular unit. So it's going to be a really helpful thing to know. And in this particular instance, uh, we know that our R is the radius. Well, we have to think about, well, what is the radius of this particular situation? Well, we have a circle and no doubt our radius is just going to be the square root of that nine. So we have r is equivalent to 3 in this case. So there would be our x of t expression. Now we have a couple of things that we need to do with this. We're going to go ahead and take his derivative, which would give us negative 3 times the sine of t, right? The derivative of cosine is indeed negative. And then once we take that particular expression and square him, 
and might be running out of room so let's see if I can just scoot some things over here just a little bit and once we square him we're going to have positive 9 sine squared of t and that's going to be our x prime squared let's do the same thing for y of t albeit using a slightly different initial formula y is defined as the radius times the sine in this case, the radius is still going to be 3. And once we take the derivative of that, we get 3 times cosine of t. Still going to be positive. And then we square him, and we find ourselves sitting on 9 cosine squared. Really, the bulk of the work for this problem is coming up with the parametric equations. All right, now we have to think about hmm, our boundaries of integration. See, our boundaries of integration are going to have to be expressions in terms of t. We want to make sure that that's going to happen here. Right now, we don't have expressions in terms of t. We have these ordered pairs. So one of the things that we can do is we can pick um, really any one of these particular expressions here, I suppose, and we can work with them. And by either one, I'm thinking more of the lines of either the x's or the y's, and I think the x's might be our best bet. I can avoid this ugly thing here temporarily. So what I mean by that is let's focus on these values here, 3 and 3 over 2. We know that those are x values, so those should be able to be implemented into this expression where we let the x be the x coordinate. So in the first one, 3 would equal 3 cosine of t. And then we could let 3 halves equal 3 times the cosine of t. And all this is going to do is give us some t values that correspond to those two points. So in this first case when we divide each side by 3 cosine of t is 1 we think about all the different possibilities for that to be true cosine of t is equal to 1 well that's going to happen at time 0 it would also happen at time 2 pi but we're going to deal with the very first time that occurs in this case at 0 same thing for this problem here. We're going to divide both sides by 3. The cosine of t is going to equal 1 half in this case. So we think about, OK, for what value of t is the cosine equal to a half? Again, you can use the unit circle. You can do a variety of things here. But basically, I like to draw a picture where I say, OK, what angle measure must that be in order for that cosine to be 1 over 2? And this is going to be your 60 degree angle, or pi over 3. Of course, there are many other instances which this occur. We are looking for that first instance. So we have 0 and pi over 3 that are going to serve as our boundaries. So for our surface area, which I'll use the letter s, I know I can construct my formula using 2 pi. And then I will integrate from 0 up to pi over 3. And now I have to use the correct radius. Well, since I am revolving this around the x-axis, as it says, right? You see your little marking there. That means that the radius would just be this distance, which is the y direction. So I would use my y expression, which is this 3 times the sine of t. So you're going to plop him in first. I will multiply that by the square root of, and then I've got each of these two expressions that I've written off to the right side up there in blue and red, 9 sine squared of t plus 9 cosine squared of t. All of that's going to be placed within the square root. We're integrating with respect to t, and we actually catch a bit of a break here. Because this expression inside the square root really simplifies nicely. And I want to make sure that you all see that. We can factor out a 9. I think you all see that. Or actually a square root of 9. And then what remains is just this sine squared plus cosine squared, which we all know is equal to 1. That square root of 9 that factors out is just going to be a 3. So all of this expression that you see here is nothing more than just 3. 
which means that if I bring that 3 with this 3 and the 2 pi, I could have myself an 18 pi out in front. Now if I integrate the sine, the sine of t, well, the integration of sine would be negative cosine, I find that this was not a very challenging integral whatsoever. And then I still have my boundaries. And now we just plug them in, and we call it a day. So we'd have our 18 pi in front, negative cosine of pi over 3. Think about that. I don't know if we have to think about that too much, because we already talked about finding the cosine of pi over 3 over here. It was 1 half. All that we have now is a negative in front of it. There is a built-in minus in with your definite integral. And the cosine of 0, well, we have kind of talked about that as well. That's going to be a negative 1. So got to keep track of your negatives very carefully here. And so essentially you have 18 pi multiplied by what will eventually become a positive half here. And so you're going to get 9 pi as your surface area. And of course, that would be measured in square units. We don't have to state that because the units weren't given. But that's how much space there would be around the outside all the way around of that particular shape. So again, it's kind of a nice little byproduct of, of using arc length um, you know, with parametric equations. It's something that I, I really think that all high school students should be exposed to. But once you guys get through this particular concept, it, it's not something that you have to keep on your radar as you prepare for the AP calculus. Anyway, I certainly hope this helps. And this concludes all of our 9.3 content. Uh, we hope to see you when we uh, begin some of our next videos over the next topics. Thanks for joining.